As you just heard, I'm a sociolinguist, which in practical terms means that I spend a lot of time studying language use as it occurs in different natural habitats. And one of those habitats that I'm especially interested in is how we use language to communicate with others in online environments. You may at this point be asking yourself, what am I as a language person doing here at a tourism conference? Uh, the answer to that question is, for the last eight years, my research has centered on the language that people use when they write reviews and post them on sites like TripAdvisor. Many of you, I'm sure, are well aware of both the challenges and the benefits that user-generated content like online reviews provide. And depending on what areas of business you work in, you may think that online reviews are really useful, or maybe you think that online reviews are Let's just say not so great. But whatever side of the fence you're on, I hope that you'll find at least something interesting in what I'm talking about today as I bring a linguistic perspective to online reviews. One thing I think we can all agree on probably is that online reviews at least have the potential of offering us information rich and sometimes truly compelling stories of consumer experiences. But as we know, there are always two sides to every story. So in the first part of my presentation, I'll be focusing on the insights that I've gained from studying reviews more from the consumer side of things. And then in the last few moments of my presentation, I'll shift more to the practical implications for businesses, like what can businesses take away from all of this. OK. Um, I began my research back in 2007, and so I'm, I'll be showing you some examples from data as we go along. And so this was one of the very first hotel reviews that I collected. And um, this was, again, in 2007, where in terms of the evolution of digital media, we didn't yet have the degree of online presence integration that we have today. And so at that point in time, I noticed that about 50% of reviewers were choosing to leave their profile infos blank. So we didn't have the demographics on them. But as I started studying texts in depth, I saw that review writers are actually providing us with quite a bit of information that's woven into the text themselves. So as consumers sort of inscribe their social identities into their texts, we can find out a lot about them. So here, in just three short sentences, you can see that the review writer is a wife. She's a military wife, in fact. She's got a limited travel budget and limited time to travel. So in addition to these sorts of these types of information, um, we can also find information about what consumers value and what they've come to expect. Um, one of the earlier speakers mentioned building a sense of anticipation. So we know in the travel business that expectations are incredibly important. And I found in my early work on complaints on TripAdvisor that complaints often happen when there's been a mismatch between a consumer's anticipatory expectations and the realities that they encounter once they get to a property. So I wanted to um, show you one of the tools that I use as a linguist to get more information about what's going on. So I found that the word expect and expecting happen quite a bit. So I use a tool called a concordancer. And here you're seeing a screenshot. And seeing words in context like this makes linguists like me really excited, because you can hone in and see what's going on with a particular word or word family. So here you see you know, expect, expecting, expected, and so on. And the concordancer gives me um, many different kinds of information, one of which is word frequencies. It turns out that expectations and expecting words are quite frequent in reviews, especially so in negative ones. But in addition to word frequencies, the software also tells me what other words or phrases co-occur with a particular word, kind of like neighbor words, we might think of them. Um, linguists call these word relationships collocations. And so if, if you look to the right of the highlighted words, you can see that very often in close um, conjunction with these words, we see reference to a particular category of hotel or a class of or a type of property, or even brand names. So using tools like these, linguists can help businesses, for example, gain insights into how maybe their branding strategies are being reflected at the level of consumer discourse. 
Speaking of language patterns, another really interesting pattern that I discovered had to do with the word good. And I could talk about good for hours on end, but I'll restrict it to the, just this one slide. Um, good, it turns out, is actually quite common in negative reviews. We wouldn't expect this. These are all excerpts from one-star reviews, by the way, so the worst of the worst, right? But good is actually more common than the word bad in negative reviews. And as you can see in context here, one of the things this tells us is that some reviewers, probably about 30 or 40 percent, try to provide a more objective or balanced account of experience. So they're pointing out the pros as well as the cons. And there's some research that indicates that as readers, we value these kinds of reviews much more than reviews that are either categorically positive or categorically negative. Another one of my findings has been that review writers are also reader, review readers. And this may seem kind of like common sense, but you'd be surprised. As we interact in different online platforms, many of you probably participate in a variety of different types of social media, one of the things you might notice is that there are some people who post a lot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're reading or listening to what other people are posting, or at least they're not referencing that in their own texts. But on TripAdvisor, the reverse is true. On TripAdvisor, it seems like review writers are very sensitive to contextualizing their own subjective experiences within what's been written before about the same property. And so I've got a couple of examples of this phenomenon. Something that I thought was also interesting, and you can see this really well illustrated in the last example, is people are reading reviews that have been written, but there are actually people who read them and then admit to having ignored them. Like you see in the last instance, I ignored the prior warnings on this and similar sites, but then went and stayed there anyway. So this is something that I call the read but don't heed phen phenomenon. I'm not a psychologist, but part of me wants to get inside the heads of these people. Like, why would you read all the negative reviews and still choose to stay at a property? And I think this excerpt gives us insight into what's going on here. There's actually sort of two things going on here. So on the one hand, I think as review um, readers, we go about processing information um, in a way that is more heuristic than analytical. So in other words, we're not applying rules like a computer algorithm would, but we're picking up bits of information from all the opinions that are out there on review sites, and we're using that information to determine what's most relevant to us. This kind of begs the question, how do we know what bits are the most relevant? One principle that I find really convincing is the principle of homophily, which suggests that we tend to look for the opinions and value the opinions of others who we perceive to be the most like us. So going back to that example that we just looked at, most likely what happened was this particular review writer read the other negative reviews, and from there picked out bits of information that told her, oh, these authors probably do not belong to the category early 20s or the category likes going out at night, and therefore uh, the issue with the noise isn't going to be bother me. So this is perhaps the most important message that I have today, which is that a bad review is not the end of the world, even a couple of bad reviews. As we just saw, there are people who will read all the negative reviews and still choose to stay at a particular property. Related to that is also quite a bit of research from economics which suggests that a bad review is actually better for business than no review at all. Related to this is, I think, a common mis misperception that the kinds of people who go online and write reviews are generally dissatisfied, people who are unhappy, impossible to please. But this is actually not the case. The reverse is true here as well. So what you're looking at is the J-shaped distribution. And people who have studied a variety of review sites have found that this distribution is pretty typical. It doesn't matter if you're looking at Yelp or TripAdvisor or Amazon. The uh, skew is always in the positive direction. So there are always going to be more five-star reviews than any other star reviews. So we've talked a little bit now about the consumer side of things. I'd like to switch um, more to the business side of things now. And um, so when people hear that I do this kind of research, they often want to know what are the practical implications? What can businesses do about online reviews and what should they be doing? Some of you may already be using um, online reviews as kind of a feedback mechanism, maybe to complement customer satisfaction surveys. Um, 
If you're doing this, it's important to keep in mind that online reviewers are a very special sample of your population. They're probably about 10% of your total customer base, but they're an incredibly powerful and influential 10%. So we know that they're highly motivated. Reviewers tend to have an above average level of education, and we know that they're at least somewhat tech savvy. So they can be some of your most influential and powerful spokespeople. I'll give you an example. This summer I was doing interviews with a number of businesses in the local area where I live. The, I've switched the focus of my research now from the language that consumers use on websites like TripAdvisor to the language that businesses are using as they reply. Um, and so as I was talking to one PR manager for a local hotel, he said, you know what? Our loyal customers are actually helping me manage negative reviews online. So on the rare occasion that somebody posts something negative about our hotel, and I think the example he gave me was somebody complained about the beds being uncomfortable. A number of other reviewers then sort of chimed in and said, you know, I disagree with the reviewer who said the beds are uncomfortable. I've been staying at this hotel for five years and I find the beds great, right? So this is one way in which other reviewers can sort of help businesses manage um, negative things that are posted online. But of course, businesses probably shouldn't leave it all up to consumers, right? And should be taking more of a proactive approach, responding to reviews either publicly or privately. I recently read uh, an article that suggested that the worst thing that a business can do is to not respond to a negative review. But I'm actually not so sure that's the case. As I've been looking at businesses' responses, I've seen that there's quite a wide range of variability in the tone that they take. And so they range from the just beautifully crafted responses that go point by point and address every single issue raised by the reviewer, elaborately crafted texts that look like they must have taken at least an hour to write, all the way to the more kind of generic or canned sounding responses, which might strike some consumers as dubious in terms of their sincerity, all the way down to sort of the epic fails. And so I'm going to end by showing you an example of one of these epic fails. So there is a local restaurant owner in my community who's sort of notorious for doing this. So when people um, complain about his business on Yelp, he will follow up and usually he begins by insulting the customer, calling them a name, calling the reviewer. And I'm not even going to repeat the names that he uses here. Um, but what happens is later on Yelp, other readers and reviewers take note of this behavior and comment on it. And as you see in this instance, they even voice their disapproval, right? So this tells us that consumers are paying attention to what businesses say as they go about responding to reviews. And so I'd like to leave you with this thought then. This is still kind of a emerging area, this form of business communication. What is the right tone to take? What's the right strategy here? And as the norms kind of continue evolving, I think the businesses who eventually will emerge as leaders in how to effectively and elegantly respond to reviews online are going to be the ones who see this as more um, than just fixing a problem or turning around one dissatisfied customer. And instead, those businesses who really seize this opportunity as a way to reinforce their branding overall. Thank you.